and manipulate favor. And we're only in the primaries. Imagine what that will look like in the general election. Imagine what that will look like with that presidency. That's some 1984 big brother, scary, scary stuff. Seriously. The internet has really been Bernie's domain because as we all well know, the corporate media is very in pocket and very biased and the blackout on him has been very, very hurtful because I think he'd be sweeping otherwise because when people hear his message, when the debates are not done in terrible times and people actually watch them rather than the summary on the corporate media and actually get to hear him directly, they are moved, they are inspired. And yes, that's exactly why I haven't been doing press in the corporate media, but solely on Democracy Now! and the Young Turks. And I gotta say, when I got arrested for Democracy Spring, you know, in the follow-up week that had Democracy Awakening, it was crazy to me to think that TMZ was the one who broke the story. <laughs> Honestly and authentically, and if you want to have, give yourself a little experience of what media literacy is, look at all how my arrest was posted by all the different media sections. Some of them really went into what Democracy Spring was about, taking the money out of politics, overturning Citizens United, <laughs> Democracy Awakening, bringing back, restoring the, the Voting Rights Act. Some of, that was, some of that was talked about, but it didn't really get into the fact that I talked about, yes, that's what we were there for, but also that the police were really great with us, but they're not always so great with Black Lives Matter activists and dreamers and Occupy movements. And maybe we can leave now to talking about that. And now, as a campaign strategy, we are being bullied. And somehow that is okay and not being talked about with the richness that it needs to. I'm with the candidate who voted against the Patriot Act twice. I'm with the candidate who recognizes that Edward Snowden did us a solid. I'm with the candidate who I don't fear net neutrality for. I'm with the candidate who understands that we actually save money by all of us having health care. We save money by all of us getting an education. That fracking is... So let's keep injecting love into this process and authenticity and integrity. Don't just take my word for it. Please welcome Senator... Bernie Sanders, who will tell you a little bit more about that. From this. Thank you all. What a, what a wonderful turnout. And thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Let me thank Adam Wilson, Conrad, and Representative Kim Williams, and Rebecca Fay Powers. And let me thank Rosario Dawson. I think, as, as most of you know, Rosario is a great American actress, but she is more than a great actress. She has devoted a significant part of her life to making sure that we end racism, that we end all forms of discrimination in this country. And she stood up and fought for people who often don't have a voice. So I thank Rosaria for all that she's done and for her role on this campaign. Let me, let me begin uh, by quoting uh, to you some words of a guy that many of you know of, and some of you know personally, and that is the Vice President of the United States. 
Uh, Joe Biden was just quoted the other day in what the vice president continues. He says, I like the idea of saying we can do much more because we can. And then he says, I don't think any Democrats ever won saying we can't think that big. We ought to really downsize here because it's not realistic, he said in a mocking tone. Come on, man, this is the Democratic Party. I'm not part of the party that says, well, we can't do it, end of quote. What Joe Biden is saying is exactly what this campaign is about. It is asking the hard questions of why not? Why not? Now, if we were a poor country, and there are many poor countries all over the world, and somebody said, you know, we should have a great educational system for all of our kids. We should have health care for all of our people. We should have a great infrastructure. If we were, if people raised those questions in a poor nation, then people would say, well, you know, that's a great idea, but we're poor. We can't do that. But let me be very clear. You are living today not in a poor country. You're living in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. So we have a right to ask and a right to demand that this country and our government work for all of us and not just the 1%. We have already won 16 states in this nominating process. And with your help on Tuesday, we're going to win here in Delaware. We started this campaign at 3% in the polls, 60 points behind Secretary Clinton. In the last week or two, there have been national polls having us in the lead. And if you look at the matchups, the matchup polls between Donald Trump and myself, we are beating them in every instance. And almost always by larger margins than Secretary Clinton. In other words, we have confounded the experts. We are in this campaign to win, and with your help, we will do that. To pick up on Joe Biden's point, what this campaign is asking people is to think outside of the box, outside of the status quo. Don't accept what the media tells you in terms of the options that we have. We can think much bigger. We can create the kind of nation we know the United States can become. If we think about half a loaf, we will get crumbs. If we think about small ideas, we will get small results. Now this campaign is creating the energy and the excitement that it is because we are doing something very unusual in contemporary American politics, we are telling the truth. The truth is not always pleasant and it's not always something we want to hear, but whether it is in our own personal lives or our political lives, our nation's life, 
we have got to confront the reality, not sweep it under the rug, if we in fact want to go forward effectively. So what are the truths? What are the truths that many would prefer to sweep under the rug? Issue number one. As the former chairman of the U.S. Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, I have talked to veterans from way back when, people who have put their lives on the line to defend our way of life, our democracy. And let me be very clear in telling you, I worry very much today about the future of American democracy. I worry about a Citizens United Supreme Court decision which allows billionaires to buy elections. <laughs> Democracy is not a complicated concept. It is one person, one vote. Not people with extraordinary wealth buying elections. We will never effectively address the crises that we face when we have a Congress that is beholden to wealthy campaign con contributors, and we will never address that issue unless we overturn this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision. When a handful of billionaires like the Koch brothers and a few of their friends are prepared to spend are prepared to spend nine hundred million dollars in this campaign cycle, that is not democracy, that is oligarchy, and we will not allow that to proceed. I want this country to have a vibrant democracy. I want us to have one of the highest voter turnout rates in the world, not one of the lowest. I want the people in this room, in this state, in this country, who want to be involved in the political process, whether you're progressive, conservative, moderate. I want you to be able to run for office without begging wealthy people for campaign contributions. And I want voting rules to be very simple. In America, if you're 18 years of age and you're a citizen of this country, you are registered to vote. End of discussion. So goal number one, we need a vibrant democracy where the voices of all of our people shape the future of this country, not a oligarchic form of society where billionaires buy elections. <laughs> Point number two, and again, when we talk about the need to deal with the reality of American society, we've got to talk about what's going on in the economy. And the truth is we have a rigged economy. A rigged economy. Think about it for a second. And by the way, you're not going to see this on television. You're not going to read about it too often in the papers. But here is the truth. The truth is that today in America, the top one-tenth of one percent, not one percent, one-tenth of one percent, owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. The top 20 wealthiest people in this country today in economy that we need to be the great nation we should be. And let me tell you, let me tell you how the rigged economy works, because it's not just a grotesque level of income and wealth inequality. Here's how it works. We have the wealthiest family in America is the Walton family who owns Walmart. Okay, they own more wealth than the bottom 40% of the American people, one family. That's pretty bad. But you know what's even worse? You got it exactly right. It's exactly what I was going to say. The gentleman here, gentleman up front said, 
they don't pay their workers wages that their workers can live on. So here you have it. Think about it for a moment. Wealthiest family in America, more wealth than the bottom 40%, yet they pay wages to their employees that are so low that many of their workers are forced to go on food stamps and Medicaid. And who is paying? This is the rigged economy. Who is paying taxes to provide the food stamps and the Medicaid? You are. So, on behalf of the Walton family, I want to thank you very much. You're really nice guys. They appreciate it. You know, they're only worth tens of billions of dollars, and they do appreciate your subsidizing their business. Needless to say, that's a bad joke. Because it's not funny. You know, and I have heard all over this country, you know, you got Republican governors, they talk about welfare reform, people ripping off the welfare system. You know who the biggest welfare beneficiary in this country is? It's the Walton family. Now this won't get on television either, so you got to listen carefully, you won't see it on TV. But I say to the Walton family, get off of welfare, pay your workers a living wage. But the rigged economy is not just the grotesque level of wealth inequality, which, by the way, is worse today in America than in any time since 1928, just before the Great Depression. But here's what else is going on, and this is why we have got to think outside of the box to do what Joe Biden says, be aspirational, think big. How does it happen? I want you all to think about this. You all know that there has been an explosion of technology in the last 20 or 30 years. And that means that worker productivity has significantly increased. How does it happen that with all of this new technology, all this increase in worker productivity, all of the global economy, how does it happen that people by the millions in this country are working longer hours for lower wages? How does it happen that in America today, you got one worker? Today, you don't know any families where mom is not working, dad's not working, the kids are not working. We work the longest hours of any people in the industrialized world. You know that? We work, the Japanese are very hard working people. We work longer hours per year than do the Japanese. And yet at the end of all that, listen to this. Mom's working, dad's working, the kids working, people working crazy hours. 58% of all new income generated today goes to the top 1%. In fact, the wealthy are doing phenomenally well. Last 30 years, the top one-tenth of 1% has seen a doubling of the percentage of wealth it owns while the middle class continues to shrink. That is a rigged economy. And our job is to do an economy, to create an economy that works for the children, that works for the elderly, that works for the working families, not an economy that just works for the 1%. But it's not just a corrupt campaign finance system in which billionaires and Wall Street and their super PACs buy elections. And it is not just a rigged economy, but it is also a broken criminal justice system. Here is the facts. Again, think outside of the box. Ask yourself this question. Why should it be? that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, we have today more people in jail than any other country on earth. We are locking up 2.2 million people and spending $80 billion a year to lock them up. Millions of lives being destroyed. Now, I've been all over this country, and I have been in communities 
where the unemployment rate for young kids is 30, 40, 50 percent. Young kids who've graduated high school want to get their feet on the ground and want to become adults and make some money and have some independence. But you can't do that if you cannot find a job. So what I will propose, if elected president, is to invest in jobs and education for our kids, not jails or incarceration. We do not want to have the dubious distinction of more people in jail than any other country. We want the best educated workforce in the world. And when we talk about criminal justice, we have got to make certain that our local police departments are demilitarized, do not look like occupying armies. We have got to make sure that local police departments reflect the diversity of the communities they serve. I was a mayor in Burlington, Vermont for eight years. I worked closely with my police department, work with police departments all over the country. Most police officers, the overwhelming majority, hard-working, honest people doing a very difficult job. But, but, like any other public official, when a police officer breaks the law, that officer must be held accountable. As a nation, we must understand that lethal force by a police officer should be the last response, not the first response. We have got to end private corporate ownership of jails and detention centers. We have got to rethink the so-called war on drugs. Many people don't know this. Many people don't know this, but over the last 30 years, millions of Americans have received police records, criminal records, because of possession of marijuana. And if you have, if you have a police record and you go in and you look for a job, it may be hard to get that job. Right now, under the Federal Controlled Substance Act, marijuana is listed at the highest level as a Schedule One drug. I have introduced legislation to take marijuana out of the Federal Controlled Substance Act. It is the responsibility of states to determine whether or not marijuana should be legal. Four states have more, I expect, will in the near future. But it should, possession should not be a federal crime. But here's another issue that we have got to deal with. All over this country, including my own state of Vermont, we have a serious, serious problem regarding opiate abuse, heroin addiction, and people dying every single day from overdose. Now the best way to my mind to deal with this serious crisis is to understand that substance abuse and addiction should be treated not as a criminal issue, but as a health issue. All over this country, and I can tell you as a senator because I get these calls in my office and other senators get the same calls, families are in trouble. People are worried about whether or not a member of their family can get off of heroin, get off of the opiates. They're worried about suicide. They're worried about a family member going out and doing something really crazy. We need a revolution in mental health treatment in this country.
Again, again, thinking outside of the box. Just think about it. We got thousands and thousands of people walking the streets of America today. They're suicidal. They're homicidal. They're addicted to drugs. They're getting into criminal activity. We need to provide those people with the help that they need today, not six months from now. Let me say a few words about the differences that exist between Secretary Clinton and myself on some of the important issues facing our country. We have chosen different paths in terms of how we raise the funds we need to run our campaigns. When I began this campaign almost a year ago, we had to make a very simple but important choice. Do we do? in our campaign what every other campaign is doing and establish a super PAC. We agreed with you. And here is why. Because super PACs are simply a mechanism to vacuum in huge sums of money from huge sums of money, right? from Wall Street, from billionaires, from corporate America, from the fossil fuel industry. We don't want their money. We don't need their money. We don't represent their interests. So we chose to go another way, unprecedented. And that is to say to the middle class, if you want a campaign that will stand with you, that will take on the powerful and greedy special interest in this country. We need your help. And what has happened over the last year is we have received over 7 million individual campaign contributions. 7 million. Anybody know what the average contribution is? $27. You know, I was at uh, the Gettysburg uh, battlefield uh, just the other day. And on the spot where Lincoln, or near the spot where Lincoln gave his famous Gettysburg address in 1863. And at the end of his speech, he talks about the need to have in our country a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And that is exactly what we are trying to do in this campaign. And when you raise money from millions of people at 27 bucks a clip, that is a campaign of the people. <laughs> Secretary Clinton has chosen to raise her money in the old-fashioned way, or at least what is now part of the contemporary political process, and that is have a number of super PACs. Her last, her last reporting period, her super PAC reported $25 million in special interest, $15 million from Wall Street alone. And on top of that, she has given numerous speeches to Wall Street for $225,000 a speech. Now, now, Every candidate who receives a lot of money from special interest always has the same response, and that is, oh, it won't impact me. But the question you have got to ask is, why do some of the most powerful special interests in this country make campaign contributions? They understand exactly what they are doing. All right? Now, our differences are not just in how we raise money. Our differences are in foreign policy. In 2002, there was a debate in Congress which dealt with the most important foreign policy issue in the modern history of America, and that was the war in Iraq. I listened very closely to what George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and all the rest had to say and I ended up not believing a word they were saying.
I not only voted against that war, I helped lead the opposition to that war, and only I do wish so much that our side was successful and we never went into that disastrous war. <laughs> Secretary Clinton heard the same evidence she was then in the Senate. She voted for the war. But it's not just, it's not just the war in Iraq. In my view, look, in the real world, sometimes we have to go to war. But war and military force should always be the last possible response, not the first response. And I got to tell you, I am not impressed by politicians, often Republicans, who get up. They're really tough guys. They want to go to war all over the world. They want to overthrow this one. They want to go there. They want to go there. Understanding what happens the day after you overthrow that tyrant. Here is another area that Secretary Clinton and I disagree on. It is not a sexy area. Media doesn't talk about it at all, which can tell you, therefore, that it's a very important issue. And that is our disastrous trade policies. All right? Again, not a sexy issue. But here's what it's about. For the young people, I will tell you something, and you could Google this as well. There was once upon a time when you could go shopping in the United States of America. I know you don't believe me, but this is true. You could buy products manufactured in the United States of America, not in China. That's true. But what happened over the last 40 or so years is corporations have decided that they do not want to pay workers in Delaware or Vermont or any place else a living wage. Why would you want to pay somebody 20, 25 bucks an hour when you could shut down here, throw those workers out on the street, go to Mexico, go to China, go to Vietnam, pay people very low wages, and then bring your product back into this country? That is the entire basis of our trade policies, NAFTA, CAFTA, permanent normal trade relations with China. The whole goal is to shut down plants in America, pay people low wages abroad, bring your profits back here, and make billions in profit. I tell corporate America today, here's a heads up, guys. If I'm elected president, we are going to change those policies. If you want the American people to purchase your products, and every night on TV we got all the ads telling us to buy this and buy that. If you want us to buy your products, start manufacturing those products in Vermont, Delaware, and in the United States of America. Now I have opposed every one of these disastrous trade agreements Secretary Clinton has supported virtually all of them. That's a big difference of opinion. I believe, and this is not a radical idea, that in America, if you work for 40 hours a week, you should not be living in poverty. And you can do the arithmetic as well as I do. And that is if you're making seven and a quarter an hour, if you're making eight bucks, ten bucks an hour, you are living in poverty. And that is why I disagree with Secretary Clinton. She wants to raise the minimum wage, that's good. But she wants to raise it to twelve bucks an hour, not enough. We need fifteen dollars an hour. Think of you know. Climate change is already doing devastating harm in our country and around the world today. And what the scientists tell us, and they are virtually unanimous in telling us this, is that if we do not get our act together in the next few years, by the end of this century, the planet Earth will be 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. That is unbelievable. And what that means is more drought, more floods, more extreme weather disturbances, more acidification of the ocean, more rising sea levels, and more international conflict. 
There will be international conflict because people will be fighting over water. They will be fighting over land to grow their crops. And that is why we have a moral responsibility to do everything possible to leave this planet in a way that is healthy and habitable for our children and our grandchildren. And in the same way, we have got to tell corporate America they cannot continue to ship our jobs to low-wage countries. We have got to tell the fossil fuel industry that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of this planet. And what that means, what that means is the United States has got to lead the world working with China, Russia, India, other countries, in transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. We can save unbelievable amounts of energy by weatherizing and making more efficient our homes and our buildings we can create a rail system and a mass transit system that gets cars off of the roads. And we can and must invest heavily in sustainable energies like wind, solar, geothermal, and other technologies. Now let me tell you something. And this kind of connects the dots. When I talk about a corrupt campaign finance system, people say, well, yeah, that's bad. What you have to understand is that corrupt campaign finance system impacts every aspect of our lives. Think about how it can be that we have a Republican Party which, with very few exceptions, rejects the concept of climate change, let alone wants to do anything about it. Now here is the point, if you think that the Republicans in this sense are just dummies, that is not the case. The real reason is that the moment that some Republican stands up and says, you know, climate change is real, it's really dangerous, we've got to do something about it. On that day, the Koch brothers and the big money interest in the fossil fuel industry will cut their campaign funds. That is what a corrupt campaign finance system is doing. And that is why we have got to, but it is not. We need to be bold if we are going to transform our energy system. I want to say one other area, talk about one other area of differences. You know, a great nation is morally judged not by how many millionaires it has and not by how many nuclear weapons it has. It is judged by how it treats the weakest and most vulnerable amongst us. Dirty. You can do you can do the arithmetic as well as I can. Nobody, if you're a disabled veteran, if you're a senior, you're somebody with disabilities, you're not gonna make it on ten thousand dollars a year social security. Now what is totally outrageous and an, indic an indication of how far right the Republican Party has gone is in response to this crisis, you know what the Republicans want to do? They want to give more tax breaks to billionaires and cut Social Security. Well, we've got some bad news for them. We are not going to cut Social Security. In fact, we're going to do exactly the opposite. Instead of giving tax breaks to billionaires, we're going to ask them to pay more in taxes. Instead of cutting Social Security, we're going to expand Social Security benefits. And the way you do that is you lift the cap. Right now, somebody making millions contributes the same amount into the Social Security Trust Fund to somebody making 118000 That's the maximum. Lift that cap, 
has somebody making $5 million a year pay the same percentage of his or her income into the Social Security Trust Fund as somebody making 40000 a year. We can extend Social Security for 58 years and significantly expand benefits. Throughout this campaign, I have asked... Now again, I'd like you to think outside of the box for a second. Young people throughout their entire lives were told by their parents, their teachers, by society, go out, study hard, get the best education that you can. That's where the good jobs are, and that's what your life is about, to get as much education as you can. And millions of young people did exactly that. But then they have suddenly found themselves thirty, fifty, seventy thousand dollars in debt. <laughs> Frankly, that's nuts. Think about it for a second. Why are we punishing millions of people for doing the right thing and getting the education they need? We should be rewarding people for getting an education, not punishing them. All over this country, let me ask you a question right here. How many people here are dealing with student debt? All over this country, I get the same response. Young woman, Burlington, Vermont, dreamed to become a doctor. She became a doctor, $300,000 in debt. Young dentist in Iowa, $400,000 in debt. Guy in Nevada took out his student loan 25 years ago. He's more in debt today than he was when he took it out. People paying off that debt decade after decade. Talk to a woman in New Hampshire. She's paying her own student debt, and then she's paying her daughter's student debt as well. All right? That is crazy stuff. And therefore, we've got to do a few very commonsensical things. Number one, we all understand that a college degree today, in many ways, is the equivalent of what a high school. Think what America looks like when mom goes to work or dad goes to work, and they know that their kids are getting quality care from well-trained, well-paid instructors who are proud to be child care workers. And think of what happens when we don't do that, when kids get into the first grade unprepared intellectually or emotionally. This is called changing our national priorities. This is called investing in our people rather than in corporate America or Wall Street. So not only do we need a strong child care system and a first-class public education system, we also have to deal with this crisis of student debt. And that is why I believe that people holding student debt now should be able to refinance that debt at the lowest interest rates they can find. Now, there is nothing radical about what I am saying. vast majority of the American people agree with what we are talking about right now. But our critics come back. And this gets back to Joe Biden and aspirational. Critics come back. And they say, well, Bernie, you're a nice guy. You want to provide free tuition at public colleges and universities. You want to lower student debt. You want to create a first-class child care system in America. Great ideas, Bernie. How are you going to pay for them? I will tell you how we're going to pay for them. Over the last 30 years, there has been a massive transfer of wealth in this country from the middle class to the top one-tenth of one percent. We are going to transfer that money back into the hands of the middle class. We can lower student This is not a radical idea. And like many other ideas, we don't go forward unless we are prepared to think big. 
to say that everybody in the United States of America who has the qualifications and the ability should be able to get a higher education is not a radical idea. It is a common sense American idea that will make this country stronger. I have been in this campaign all over the country. I have been to Flint, Michigan and talked to parents who have seen cognitive damage done to their beautiful children as a result of the kids drinking poison water, lead in the water. I have been fighting a war like the one in Iraq that we never should have gotten into, but we are always told we don't have the money to invest in rebuilding inner cities in America. And you know what? You know what? Those people are right. That's always the way it is. There's always money for war. There's always money for military expenditures. There's always money for tax breaks for billionaires. But somehow there is not enough money to rebuild inner cities or to pay attention to the people in this country who are hurting the most. Well, you know what? We're going to change that dynamic. This campaign is listening to the Latino community and they are reminding us that there are 11 million undocumented people in this country, many of whom are being exploited today because when you don't have any legal rights, your employer can do anything he wants, cheat you, take away your wages, work you in ways that are illegal. And that is why I believe we need to pass comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. And if Congress does not do its job in passing that legislation, I will pick up where President Obama left off and use the executive powers of the presidency to do all that I can. This campaign is listening to some people whose voices and pain are almost never heard, and that is people in the Native American communities of this country. I don't have to tell anybody here that from, be from before when this country became a country, when the first settlers came over here, the Native American people were lied to, they were cheated, and treaties negotiated were broken. I don't have to tell you also that we owe the Native American people more than we can ever repay. They have contributed so much to the fabric of this nation, and among many other things, and maybe most importantly, they have taught us the profound lesson that as human beings, we are part of nature. We have got to live with nature. We cannot destroy nature and survive. And yet, if you go to reservations around this country, if you go to many Native American communities, what you find is unbelievably high levels of poverty, of unemployment, you find young people committing suicide at horrific rates. If elected president, we will change our relationship to the Native American people. If we think big and not small, we ask ourselves another very simple question. And that is, how does it happen that every other major country on earth, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Italy, Holland, Scandinavia, Canada, whatever. Every one of those countries guarantees health care to all of their people as a right. We are the only major country that does not guarantee health care.
to all of our people. So let me be as clear as I can be. I believe from the deepest part of my being that health care is a right of all people, not a privilege. That whether you are young or old, rich or poor, you have the right to high quality health care as a citizen of this country. The Affordable Care Act has done a number of good things and I'm proud to be on the committee that helped write that bill. But we can do more. We are now spending far more per capita on health care than any other nation. Yet 29 million people still have no health insurance. Many of you are underinsured with high deductibles and co-payments. And every one of us continues to be ripped off by the greed of the drug companies. You want to hear crazy? This is crazy. Right now in America, one out of five Americans who go to the doctor and get a prescription are unable to fill that prescription because the medicine is too expensive. In Delaware, in Vermont, all over this country, seniors are cutting their prescription drugs, their medicine, their pills in half because they can't afford the medicine they need. And that is why, in my view, we must pass a Medicare for all health care program, guarantee health care to all of us. Right now, you got Republicans running all over the country talking about family values. Family, they just love families. All of you understand that when they talk about family values, what they mean is that no woman in this room, in this state, in this country should have the right to control her own body. I disagree. And they mean, when they talk about family values, they mean that none of our gay brothers and sisters should have the right to be married. I disagree. Now, Jane and I have been married almost 28 years. We have four kids, seven beautiful grandchildren. When we talk about family values, very different values than Republicans. And when we talk about family values, we talk about ending the embarrassment of the United States being the only major country on earth that doesn't provide paid family and medical leave. When a working class woman in this country gives birth, she should not have to be separated from that newborn baby and rush back to work in order to earn the income she needs. And that is why, that is why together, we will pass paid medical and family leave. Donald Trump will not become President of the United States. He will not become President because among many other factors, I am 15 or 20 points ahead of him in every national poll that takes place. But more importantly, he will not become president because the American people will not support a candidate who insults Mexicans and Latinos, who insults Muslims, who insults women, who insults veterans, who insults African Americans. I hope I hope that everyone here has not forgotten, 
that before Trump became a candidate for president, he was leader of the so-called Bertha movement. And that was a very dangerous and ugly movement designed to delegitimize the first African-American president of our country. This was not an instance where he disagreed with the president. That's fine. We all disagree with everybody, you know. This was an effort to say that Barack Obama really should not be the president of the United States. That was an ugly and vicious attack, and we will not forget that. <laughs> Donald Trump will not become president because we all know that as a nation, we are stronger when we come together, black and white and Latino and Asian American and Native American, gay and straight, male and female, that is our strength. And that strength of coming together will always trump dividing us up. And the American people will not support a Donald Trump for president because they understand that we are strong when we support each other. When my family is there in your time of need and you are there in our time of need. That's what a nation is about. That supporting each other will always trump selfishness. And perhaps most importantly, what the American people understand is what every great religion has always taught us, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, or whatever. And that at the end of the day, love always trumps hatred. What this, what this campaign, what this campaign is about is not just electing a president, it is creating a political revolution. And what that revolution means, this is what it means, it means that no president, not Bernie Sanders or anybody else, can alone address the enormous crises facing this country. That the only way that we deal with the issues that are out there so important to so many people is when millions of people come together, stand up, fight back, and demand a government that represents all of us, not just wealthy campaign contributors. In three days on Tuesday, here in Delaware, there is going to be a very, very important Democratic primary. What we have learned throughout this campaign is that we do well when the voter turnout is high. We do not do well when the voter turnout is low. Let us have the highest voter turnout in Delaware history on Tuesday. And let Delaware show the world that it is prepared to go forward in a political revolution. Thank you all very much.
车拿掉了。差不多死。And C-SPAN's Road to the White House coverage continues on Monday with Republican presidential candidate John Kasich at a town hall meeting in Maryland. Residents of that state head to the polls Tuesday for its presidential primary, along with Delaware, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. See Governor Kasich from Rockville, Maryland, live Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. Tonight at 10 Eastern. We'll take a look at some of the speeches by President Obama during his two terms at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, one of Washington's premier events. This year will mark his final attendance at the dinner. It turns out Jeb Bush identified himself as Hispanic back in 2009. But you know what? I, look, I understand. It's an innocent mistake. Reminds me of when I identified myself as American back in 1961. <laughs> Join us tonight at 10 Eastern. And be sure to tune in for our live coverage of this year's White House Correspondents' Dinner on Saturday, April 30th, beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern, on C-SPAN. C-SPAN's Washington Journal, live every day with news and policy issues that impact you. Coming up Sunday morning, Associated Press transportation reporter Joan Lowy joins us by phone to talk about an aviation bill pushed through the Senate this week designed to overhaul the Federal Aviation Administration, bolster airport security, and offer consumer protections for frustrated travelers. Then Constitution Party presidential nominee Daryl Castle joins us from Memphis to discuss his candidacy, the platform of the Constitution Party, and the obstacles facing third-party candidates in our current two-party system. Also, Jeffrey Cowan joins us to discuss his book, Let the People Rule, which looks at the modern political primary system created in the early 20th century and its implications for the 2016 contest. Be sure to watch C-SPAN's Washington Journal beginning live at 7 a.m. Eastern, Sunday morning. Join the discussion. Sunday on Newsmakers, Veterans Affairs Secretary Robert McDonald discusses veterans' issues, including long waits at hospitals, understaffing, and prioritizing health care. Here's a portion of his interview. VA is a three-legged stool. You take out any one of the legs and the stool falls over. Leg one is research, $1.8 billion a year on research. Research in spinal cord injuries, research in prosthetics. Um, research in TBI and post-traumatic stress, research that for-profit medical systems are not going to do. But beyond that, a lot of our research has been positive for the American public. We invented a nicotine patch. We did the first liver transplant. We've won three Nobel Prizes. We did the first electronic medical record. Uh, we were the ones, it was a VA nurse that came up with the idea of putting a barcode on with uh, uh, a medic with uh, prescriptions with medical records to keep those straight. So a lot of the a lot of the innovations that have affected American medicine have come out of the VA. And in a for-profit medical world, where are those innovations going to come from? Second is training. Uh, we train 70 percent of the doctors in the country. We're the number one employer of nurses, so we end up training a majority of the nurses. It's a system Omar Bradley set up in 1946 aligning VA hospitals with the very best medical schools in the country. For example, in, in um, uh, Durham, North Carolina, we share over 300 doctors with the Duke Medical School. They do, they do their work in both places. And the third leg is the clinical work. Um, you know, the fact that our doctors do clinical work with, um, with veteran patients who they say are the very best patients in the world. Um, and if you're a veteran, isn't it nice having somebody work with you 
who actually has to teach what they're doing because that way you're sure they know it. So it's a, it's a great system and uh, uh, privatization is not the answer. That was just part of what Veterans Affairs Secretary Robert McDonald had to say on this week's Newsmakers. He was interviewed by David Wood of the Huffington Post and Leo Shane of Military Times. Newsmakers airs Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN. This month we showcase our student cam winners. C-SPAN's annual video documentary competition for middle and high school students. This year's theme is Road to the White House, and students were asked, what issues do you want presidential candidates to discuss? One of our second prize high school East winners are from Silver Spring, Maryland. Aaron Mamovich, Isabel Fenton, and Sofia Munoz. Tenth graders at Montgomery Blair High School won presidential candidates to discuss juvenile justice reform in their video titled, Wasted Lives, A Childhood Behind Bars. You know, we're still the only country in the world that sentences kids to die, and that should never happen. I don't think juveniles should be sent to adult prison at all, even if they are treated in the criminal court. There's a lot of kids in the system who don't actually pose a public safety risk. And given what we know about the impact that commitment has on kids, it should only be used in situations where like, you absolutely have to be removed from the home. We just find this to be horrible. You know, these are young people, they need guidance, they need services, they need the rehabilitative nature of ju juvenile court to get back on track. And if you are doing good, don't look for this type of life because because it's not good. It's not meant, meant for human to be living. Psychologically, physiologically, people until they're 24, 25 are really not able to make sound judgments. Some of the research around brain development has really helped to identify that some of the activities, the things that young kids get involved in, are really more developmental in nature and are reflective of maybe a little bit of growth still yet to occur. First is the research. Really clear about the high cost and low return of juvenile incarceration. Some states spend between $100,000, $200,000 per youth per year to lock up an individual, whereas the cost for alternatives are much lower. What we're finding with risk assessments on these young people is that they're high need, not necessarily high risk. Just because a child is moderate risk to reoffend or high risk to reoffend doesn't mean that we should plunge them more deeply into the system. It means that we need to be even more careful about what the plan would be, the case plan would be, for how we would treat them in terms of their disposition. When incarcerated, juveniles are less likely to return to and complete their high school education and are more likely to continue to live a life of crime. I mean, the effects of the system are not good. Like, you don't come out of the juvenile system better by any means. There's a certain amount of uh, tainting that occurs when a young person comes into a system they don't need to. They're, they're labeled uh, in the school environment, labeled in the community as the kid who's involved in juvie, quote unquote. That even if you get uh, um, charged as an adult and you are in jail for a month, the chances of you being able to return and get back into school are really, really difficult. Juveniles must be sent to correctional facilities where they are given the chance to improve their life and education and have the opportunity to positively change their futures. In prison, the juveniles don't learn the life skills that they will need when they are released. That is why privately run programs such as Our House are needed as alternatives to typical incarceration facilities. Benny Benvenu is the director at Our House, a community-based program that teaches at-risk youth important job skills for their future and provides them with an education. Our House is a job training program where the uh, young men ages 16 to 21 come from all over the state of Maryland and from D.C. and during the daytime they learn the, the trades, uh, construction trades, small engine repair, uh, woodworking and shop, and so they do the eight hours a day like a regular work day 
And then at nighttime, we have their high school classes for them. I got kicked out by house. So when I went to go see my probation officer, they sent me to DSS for real. And DSS brought me here the same day. And I've been, there, I've been here ever since. Programs like these teach kids skills that are essential for reentry and reducing recidivism. You can get your GED here. You can learn new trades, stuff like that for real. You can make money here when you leave here. The money, all the money that you made, all of it add up for real. Silver Oaks, a private staff secure facility licensed by the Maryland Department for Juvenile Services, is the model for justice programs run by the state. So if you go to Silver Oak, and again, Silver Oak's the exception, you can earn high school credits because it functions as its own school. You can graduate from high school. Um, they will help you get set up with the co local community college. You can enroll in community college. They have kids who are there applying, like taking the SAT and the ACT and then applying to college. And they've had a bunch of kids get scholarships, academic and athletic scholarships. Um, so that, they're doing it. However, most state and government programs don't provide the same opportunities for children to get an education in prison. Organizations such as Free Minds take it upon themselves to provide services to help incarcerated youth re-enter society. I've been locked up 10 years. Uh, very first time being locked up, but to get back into society was very, and still is, a little shocking because a lot has changed. And with Free Minds, I'm learning how to express my fears without uh, deal with dramatic, you know, <laughs> negative way. Free Minds encourages incarcerated youth to use poems and creative writing to transform their lives. The program helps youth get back on track and set goals for the future. I just recently learned something new about myself as far as I didn't know I could write poetry. It makes you smile and I guess when you down and out you ain't got too much to smile about. Free Minds also helps those who were formerly incarcerated as youth learn the skills they never acquired. Today we was learning how to do basic keyboard things, how to type, um, like how to use Microsoft Word, things that I never had a job in my life, man. Everything they've told me so far is like, helping me get ready for, for society because if I did it on my own, I'd probably have been lost. So I hope we can work together this year on some bipartisan priorities, like criminal justice reform. The United States incarcerates more kids than anywhere else in the world, really. Um, and punish them more severely. Some blocks my thoughts, but when it rains, they roam free. I'm a victim of circumstance around people that don't know me. Maybe if they went through what I did, things would be different. Moms working three jobs, young sis raising children. I thought people was tripping when they said things would get better. So they was wanting one of the coats. And I was wearing a sweater. A few of the things mom wanted to give, all I wanted was love. Trying hard to be a man, but misunderstood for a thug. Maybe I would change a few things so I could go back. Moms would be smiling instead of crying. Yeah, I like that. To watch all of the prize winning documentaries in this year's Student Cam competition, Visit studentcam.org. This Sunday night on Q&A, historian Ron Chernow talks about the hit Broadway musical Hamilton that's based on his biography of Alexander Hamilton and the consulting work he did on the musical. He said to me, Ron, I was reading your book uh, on vacation in Mexico, and as I was reading it, hip-hop songs started rising off the page. And I said, really? And then he started telling me, he said, you know, Hamilton's life is a classic hip-hop narrative. And I was thinking, what on earth is this guy talking about? I think that Lynn quickly uh, picked up the fact that he had a, a world-class ignoramus about hip-hop on his hands. And he said to me on the spot, because my first question to him was, um, can hip-hop uh, be the vehicle for telling this kind of, you know, very um, large and complex uh, story. 
And he said, Ron, I'm going to educate you uh, about hip-hop. And he did on the spot. He started pointing out that um, hip-hop, you can pack more information into the lyrics than any other form because it's very, very dense and rapid. He started talking about the fact that hip-hop not only has rhymed endings, it has internal rhyme, it has wordplay. He started educating me in all of these different devices that are very, very important to the success of the, uh, of the show. Sunday night at 8 Eastern and Pacific on C-SPAN's Q&A. We're joined now by Carolyn Lukensmeyer. She is the Executive Director of the University of Arizona's National Institute for Civil Discourse. She also was previously the founder and president of America Speaks, an award-winning nonprofit that tried to engage citizens and leaders through innovative uses of public policy tools and strategies. And she served as consultant to the White House Chief of Staff from 1993 to 1994. Carol Lukensmeyer, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be with you. So the National Institute for Civil Discourse, we haven't heard a lot of civil discourse lately. Tell us what your organization does. Well, the Institute was created in 2011, after Representative Gabby Giffords' the assassination attempt on her life in Tucson. Gabby really was an elected official that worked in a completely bipartisan way, the way she introduced bills, her friendships. So the University of Arizona and the community of Tucson came together very quickly. They said, we have got to make something good come out of this horrible tragedy. So we are founded in order to see if we can have an impact on the incivility and political dysfunction that now dominates our country. And how do you do that? Well, we work with three target groups. We work with elected officials, both here in Congress and in state legislatures. We work with journalists and we work with the public. One of the things that is really unfortunate about where we are in the country is that our mass media messages and our political messages are all negative. And yet if you dig beneath that in states, in communities, and sometimes even nationally, there are a lot of positive things happening that can give us hope that we can right this situation that we're in. There's no question. Americans are completely disgusted, embarrassed, ashamed, angry, frustrated. Those are the words we hear in every community that we go to. Weber Shandrick, a well-known Washington, D.C. communications firm, does a civility poll every two years. In their 2016 polling, 95% of Americans say that incivility is a serious problem. 77% of Americans say, recognize that we're losing stature in the world. 64% say they've just stopped watching politics altogether. And you know, the stat that really worries me the most? 38% of Americans, almost 40, say that they just think that's the way it is now, that that's what politics has to be. We want to let you know that you can join in our conversation with Carolyn Lukensmeyer from the National Institute for Civil Discourse. We're going back to traditional phone lines for this segment. So Republicans, your number is 202-748-8001. Democrats, the line is 202-748-8000. Independents, your number is 202-748-8002. You can also send us a message on Twitter. The handle is at C-SPAN WJ. Uh, you mentioned that many Americans feel like the level of discourse we have now is just the way that it is. Are we in a unique period or is this different from what we've experienced historically? Well, political scientists track that pretty closely and have really been doing research about it. And their judgment is that the incivility in our politics and in our communities is the worst it's been since Reconstruction. So there's no question but what we have been on a downward slope in terms of our lack of respect for each other when we speak, the ideological absolutism about issues. When people disagree on an issue, they don't hear each other's reasoning, they don't hear enough to understand why they hold those views. They actually indicate that if you don't think like I think, I'm a better person than you are. And that is not the natural state of affairs. And what have you all found is driving this polarization of the public and the increasingly he heated rhetoric that we hear on both sides of the aisle? Well, again, there's been a tremendous amount of research and analysis that 
many structural issues. Too much money in politics, the way primaries work, which drive both parties to the extreme to be, get through the primary election. Some of our most extraordinary statesmen, Bob Bennett in Utah, Dick Luger in Indiana, have essentially been driven out of their statesmanship work in Washington by an ideologically dominated primary process. So most of what has driven us here, frankly, another piece that I know you would speak about is the media's business model has changed in a way in which so much more of what's covered in mass media about politics is really celebrity and entertainment rather than driven by news. One of the problems, these structural issues, it took us decades to get here. It'll take us decades to reverse that direction. So that means that today, to make a difference about this today, we have to rely on people. It has to be how Americans, who are very frustrated and tend to disengage because of how incivil politics have become, what we actually need to do as citizens is step in and speak up. We need to let our congressmen know that Congress should hold hearings for a Supreme Court justice because that's constitutional. Politicians need to hear from their constituents. It's not okay for me from my, I'm one of your constituents. It's not okay for you to jump on the bandwagon of the anti-Muslim rhetoric that has just seeped into this presidential primary process. So the best antidote for right now is Americans understanding that all of us, the vast majority of us want this to change. The only way it will change is if we speak up. And just for full disclosure, you all affiliated with any political party. Thank you, and I should have said that. No, we are completely nonpartisan. Our goal, American democracy is a very unique system, and it was system built to not allow any majority to completely control a policy discussion, completely to control how resources are used. So compromise was the essence of the American political system. And yet we've now in this ideological war, there are whole groups of people who say compromise by definition is against my ideological stand. So no, we're completely nonpartisan. Let's turn to the phone lines and our first caller comes from Kalispell, Montana on the Republican line. Tom, good morning. Yes, I attended a sporting event at the University of Arizona and it was a three-day event. I would like the person that's sitting there to attend a sporting event at her school and see how uncivil the people are, the, the players, the coaches, and the crowd. Tell me how you would react to that. Tom, I'm very sorry that you had that experience, and my guess is that is an experience that is replicated at sporting events all over this country at this particular point in time. It's unacceptable. That is not what should happen in collegiate sports at any point in time. But we've almost made sports at the collegiate level like the Roman theater in terms of it's a place where people get out their emotions and where they over, are overtaken in their support for their team to again be uncivil to the other spectators and teams. I, again, I'm very sorry you had that experience. And unfortunately, I know that it's not just at the University of Arizona. Robert from Frostburg, Maryland, is up next on the independent line. Robert, go ahead. Good morning, ma'am. How you doing? Good morning. Okay, look, uh, I definitely understand uh, that all seem like all all avenues of discour of reporting things to our uh, public authorities seem to be closed off to citizens. I report. I'm a disabled Vietnam veteran. I reported some veterans who were being physically 